This is Sandy Johnson, Edith Myers from John Carpenter's original Halloween, 1978. And I'm on the podcast with Don't Go Out There. Don't Go Out There, horror movie podcast. This is Nick Castle, Michael Myers in the original Halloween. There he is, always over my shoulder. In a world where zombies, ghosts, serial killers, and vampires all exist, it's Nico, Brian, Mike, and Dustin, and they are all that stand between you and the films that could end the world. Welcome to the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Podcast. Welcome back, everybody, to the Don't Go Out There Horror Movie Podcast. Just want to thank all our fans and listeners. We really appreciate all support. You guys are awesome. Before we get into tonight's film, I just want to give a quick shout out to our website, don'tgooutthere.com. My man Brian has done a fantastic job with the website. He's got it looking great. Everything about our podcast is on there. All of our episodes and interviews from episode one to our weekly release. If you want to check out all of our episodes there, maybe you have an office job, don't have access to your phone, you can listen on your desktop computer. We've done some incredible interviews in the past with some of the biggest names in horror, uh, some of your favorite slashers, uh, writers, directors. Check out our interviews if you haven't heard those yet. We got our store. We, we got some new T-shirts. Uh, Brian and Dustin have done some fantastic designs if you want to check those out. And we also have Shan's Etsy page attached as well if you want to grab a Tumblr. And we also have our social media, fa- uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Uh, we love interacting with our fans. We love you know meeting new people. We love answering your comments and questions on the air. So definitely check us out on social media. And the last thing I want to shout out is our Patreon, we call it Blood Donors. We have the traditional monthly reoccurring kind. If you're a big fan of our podcast, a big fan of our show, you want to help support us, that option is available. And we also have one-time donations. If you want to donate and, you know, have a, if you have a film review you want us to do, that option is available as well. All right, guys, jump into the film review. I'm really excited to redo this review for sure. If anybody fucked up our original episode, it was your boy, Nico. Forgot to turn his mic on, episode two, rookie mistake, but hey. You know, I'm a grizzly veteran now. I know how to do this podcast and shit a little bit. But anyway, let's jump into the film review for real. We're redoing 1978's Halloween. One of the most iconic films in all of horror. Maybe you could argue in film in general. Just, you know, low budget film that just became a giant hit. But I think it's a really good movie. I'm doing not scene by scene tonight. I'm actually diving into my thoughts. I do have some qualms with it. It's got a lot of shit that's like, yeah, it don't make no damn sense. But I'm not a hater all the way through. Fantastic movie. If I were to suggest a horror movie to someone who's never watched them, Halloween 78 is in the top three I'm going to pick. It's going to be, you know, one, two, three, four, five. Hey, you need to go watch that one. It's a throwback. It's a classic. It's one you have to see. So, yeah, I think it's a fantastic movie. Mike, I'm not going to be hating, so don't worry. Brian, you want to go next? (laughs) Yeah, you said it. I mean, simply put, this movie's iconic. I mean, it trailblazes a lot of those horror movie tropes, basically, that directors and cinematographers still emulate today, almost 45 fucking years later, unbelievably. Uh, you know, it showed how to make a movie with a tight script and a low budget, like you said. And I have something at the end, you know, in regards to that. But I got the exact same thing, Nico. I said it's it's a great introduction to horror and that, yeah, we usually save that for movies that are a little kiddish. But... I feel like that this one, minus the two tit scenes, is a good introduction to horror as long as they're of age. And after you show them Friday the 13th Part 6, and you know, like I said, they're old enough. But uh, I'll save the rest. It's a great movie. It set the precedence of horror as, as we know it, in my opinion. All right. So I've made no secret that this is my favorite horror movie of all time. Um, now, look, I know it's not perfect. I know some of the very common qualms that are out there. Uh, that I won't even call them nitpicks. If you don't like something, you don't like something. Um, but this is just a movie that I throw all that away. Like I just don't care about the mistakes it made. I actually like, I like it for, I like it for some of the mistakes it has. It's not a perfect movie. It's low budget. It's shot in, in California and there's palm trees in the back and, and it's supposed to be, you know, the middle of Illinois in the fall. Like there's just so many things that I think that the stars aligned for this movie to be as magical as it is. Um, and look, I know, Hey, I know Brian doesn't love John Carpenter and I don't blame him. There's some John Carpenter movies. I think are a little overhyped, but I don't think this is one of them. I do think he really pulled the rabbit out of his ass. As far as the filmmaking part goes 
for Halloween. Like it, this movie still holds up from a just direction standpoint, cinematography standpoint, like all the shots, the, the, the blue hue that you get. And my favorite part of this movie is the way that Michael Myers is fucking presented. It's the shape, the void, the, the emotionless, motiveless killer who is just killing just because. No reason, no sister, no long lost aunt, no, no three times removed uncle coming back to try to save him. It's just motiveless Michael Myers, the shape, the embodiment of evil on a killing spree on Halloween night. And the, the, the music being its own character, which we've talked about a ton on this show. To me, this, not the first movie to ever do it, obviously, but one of the best to ever do it as the, just the music being its own part of this movie. Scored beautifully by Carpenter, all that. And I actually, you know, small thing here, a lot of the dialogue gets picked to death, and I understand that totally and all that stuff. But I'm going to give Deborah Hill credit here. Because that's how teenagers talked in the fucking 70s. So she wrote them as realistic teenagers. So I have no problem with the dialogue. It just doesn't sound good in 2023 sometimes. I get annoyed with it. But great kills, iconic kills, iconic, you know, birth of a franchise by accident. Uh, Just I love everything about it, even the shit that I think is kind of stupid. I know we'll get to it. But driving and, 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 you know, again, I mentioned palm trees in the back and, you know, some of the stuff Loomis does and that makes him a bad psychiatrist and all this other stuff. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, man, I just love it. Even the bad shit. Um, you sure you want me to go? I'm just kidding. I don't hate this movie. I don't, I don't even dislike this movie. This is a really good movie. Um, it definitely has its problems. I've kind of been kayfabe and the boys all day, like leaning into it. Like I'm going to give this movie a four or some shit, but no, it's, it's a really good movie. It's just, uh, you know, Halloween's never been my favorite franchise. Um, it's definitely, I like it more than Nightmare on Elm Street, which I shit on plenty. So uh, that should let you know how this is going to go. I, it's got a lot of good. It's got a lot of bad. Uh, I'm a big Jamie Lee Curtis fan. No secret there. And I'm not talking about just in this movie. Like, I like a lot of her shit, man. She's fucking awesome. But, uh, and I, I really like the way they do a lot of things uh, in this movie to combat the budget that they were working with. Like they leaned into it and uh, I've got something in my notes here and I'm sure you guys have the same thing. So I'll just save it. But um, it, it's just, it's a classic by every definition of the word. I mean, it sparked a, a great franchise. It stood the test of time, even if the movie. So like I think about Terrifier, Terrifier is a shit movie, but it's got an iconic character. Michael's an iconic character, but this isn't a shit movie. So like it's, you know, it, sure. it's head and shoulders above that. Um, <laughs> It's an iconic character because the movie is also good. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 fine. It's a fine movie. Hey, man, I get it. I knew you weren't going to totally shut it. We talked about it, but way back during COVID when we were reviewing, you know, me and you were just watching Halloween 4 and then, and then 5, yeah. unfortunately, together. I remember you saying you liked the movie. I didn't think you'd change too much. Yeah, no, I then. mean, if you look at the whole franchise and you can go back when we did the 31 and 31, there are movies in the franchise that I like, but there's just a lot that I don't like or that not sure. necessarily I don't, you know, dislike. It's just some movies that are just there and don't do anything for me. This is not one of those. This is one of those that's honestly, if you don't like this movie, then I don't think you like horror at all. And I'm surprised you're listening to this podcast. So, you know, <laughs> you know last thing, this movie you know, gets a lot of flack for starting the tropes of the slasher genre or even horror in general. It was a complete accident. They didn't write it that way. You know, that the Virgin lived on purpose. Like, it, none of that shit was on purpose. It was all accidental, all the tropes. They're like, Jamie Lee Curtis's character being really fucking stupid, Laurie Strode, she's a teenager. They wrote her that way because she's a fucking teenager. So, like... That is the reason. It's n- none of the tropes were birthed on purpose, which people seem to believe, or at least a book that I read seemed to believe that it was all on purpose. And I just think that's ridiculous. All right, guys, is that it? Your boy is going to read the uh, scene by scene tonight. So uh, let these experts take on this this daunting 1978 Halloween here. All right, so you ready? Here we go. After the credit sequences, it's All Hallows' Eve, 1963, in a previously unknown town of Haddonfield, Illinois. Most notably, 43 Lampkin Lane. 
We quickly realize this is a first-person POV, and we are following someone around the house when we see friend of the show, Sandy Johnson, com, as Judith Myers and boyfriend Danny quickly making their way upstairs for what is obviously a, dare I say, quick coitus session. Same, Danny, same. We circle around and enter the back of the house where the door is left wide open and see a children's hand grab a butcher knife out of a drawer. Danny quickly exits the house through the front door, and we are now heading upstairs. We hear the clock chime, and we pick up a clown mask, completing our Halloween costume. We enter a room, and we see a semi-nude Judith sitting at her makeup table brushing her hair. We, as the assailant, stab her multiple times and watch her body hit the floor. After exiting the house, we break away to reveal we were a child named Michael the entire time, as his parents unmask him and stand stunned at the sight of him holding the butcher knife outside of their house. That's the first set of scenes. Go ahead, Nico. All right, listeners, bear with me. I'm still a little bit sick. My voice is weak, but starting the show off with a not hot take. The Halloween score, the best in film. Mind your business, Star Wars nerds. Respectfully, of course. Hey. These opening credits are great. They're so simple, yet so effective. I love the POV shot slowly walking up to the Myers house. And like Brian mentioned, we meet friend of the show, Sandy Johnson, as Judith Myers. Not in the film for long, but she's a part of one of the most memorable openings in all of horror. I love the score that plays as Michael goes back into the house. John Carpenter, as Michael Rappaport would say, don't miss with his music. Poor Judith gets one pump chump, then killed brutally by her psych- psychopath brother. What a horrible <laughs> way to celebrate Halloween evening. Good Lord. Judith puts up no fight to protect herself, though. I have to ask, was the moment too big? I love how the camera is just Michael's eyes as he walks outside and his parents find him with the bloody knife. I don't have a lot here, but this is a hell of a way to start this masterpiece off. Man, I just love everything about the open. You mentioned the score. It's fantastic. And not just the score, but some of the other music that's in you know this soundtrack I think is great. Uh, I f- was finally able to find the vinyl, and it sounds incredible on <laughs> On a vinyl player, like it, it sounds great on a record player. So I highly recommend that experience if you've never gotten the chance. Um, I love this open. I love that it's very simple. Uh, shot at night, you know, feels like fall, even though clearly we're in in California. We don't really know that because again, it's nighttime. Uh, and I love that we're the POV of the killer. I love that we're getting to see it through the eyes of Michael Myers. That is such a cool camera trick. And you know, like. Like Dustin mentioned in his open, they worked around the budget. What a cooler way to start than to like see the view as the killer. And by the way, you don't know anything about this killer. You know absolutely nothing about who you're viewing this through the mask of. Uh, and you don't know, you don't really know that it's his sister. You know, clearly it's Judith Myers, uh, but you don't know that. And I just, I can't help but always think back. And this is not the shit on Rob Zombie. But Rob Zombie gave all this way too much backstory. Like it, none of this is required. This is just enough. It, it's just enough to have him be a motiveless killer. Uh, and to see this, and look, some of the stabbing doesn't age well, I will say. Uh, but again, it, it's, it's all done really well from a technical standpoint, at least out of the time. Um, and I just love, man, I love everything about the open. I love the music, you know, pulling off the mask. Realizing it's a child, even fucking scarier, by the way. Uh, you know, just love the reveal. I love this open because it, I, I can't imagine seeing this for the theater in the first time in 1978. Not a whole lot of killer kids up to this point had been on screen. Not the first, but but really with a, a, a weapon at, at hand. You know, one of the first to really ever go that route. And I think it was really, really well done. That's about all I have. One of my favorite opens in horror movie history, to the shock of no one, I'm sure. Uh, I really appreciate the opening credits being immediate, like we don't have to wait, and there's no interruption of action because of like we get it now. So I appreciate that, and also that iconic score is just just absolutely perfect. Uh, you guys already mentioned it, but my dog is a true minute man. From the time the light went out upstairs to him saying goodbye on the stairs, it was a minute six seconds. I mean, like I always <laughs> say, it's a race. So. He did his thing. Um, how the fuck didn't he see Michael in the living room, though, with that knife as he was leaving? Like, he looked back and up the stairs, and he turned his head in that direction. So it's kind of impossible to miss a kid dressed as a clown holding a big-ass knife. He was like, don't care, had sex. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Michael's stabbing Judith, 
why the fuck did he look at the blade? Like, the point of view should have showed her and her only. No one, not even a little kid, would turn their head to look at the blade cutting through the air. Like, that just did, that didn't make sense to me. Um, but it is a really good opening scene, though. Like, it's a weir- little weird to me that it's all first person, to be honest, only because it's the only first person we get. Everything else in the movie is third person. Like, it would have been cool to see more first person from Michael's perspective on some of the other kills or some of the other moments. But instead, you know, we hear his breath a lot. But it would have just been cool to be inside the mask, I think, for some of those others. Or just don't do it at all here. Like, kind of shoot this scene how they did the rest of the movie, like from over the kid's shoulder or something. I don't know. But still very good. That's fair. All right. Scene two. October 30th, 1978, Smith's Grove, Illinois. Most notably... Smith's Grove Sanitarium during a very rainy night. We're introduced to Dr. Loomis and Nurse Marion, who are on their way to escort an incarcerated Michael to a court hearing, where Loomis states that his hope is that Michael, referred to as it, will be imprisoned for life. The two spot patients wander on the grounds as Loomis orders Marion to stay put while he runs to the gate to make a quick call. However, Michael has other plans as he jumps on top of the car and attacks Marion while smashing the passenger window open-palmed. Marion flees the scene, doing a tuck and roll in the grass while Michael hops on and cruises away in the station wagon. The evil is gone, says Loomis as we cut away. A title card tells us it's the next day, All Hallows' Eve, 1978, a night that shall live in infamy. I added that last part. It wasn't on the screen. We see a young teenager, Lori Strode, on her way to drop off a key at the Myers house we recognize from the open. We're introduced to a young Tommy Doyle and established Lori will be babysitting him that same evening and that the Myers house is haunted. We see Michael inside watching the key get dropped off and decides to follow the young lady around. We cut to Loomis trying to warn Sheriff Brackett over the phone about Michael's pending arrival and finds his clothes as well as a mechanic we see dead in the grass. We cut back to Haddonfield as Lori notices Michael stalking her throughout the day at school, but her friends Annie Brackett and Linda Vanderklok dismiss her concerns as they just try to totally work out their plans for the evening and the next day. It's Halloween. We're entitled to one good scare after all, as we are reminded by Sheriff Brackett. And we end this group of scenes with Lori hallucinating, seeing Michael in her hanging laundry outside and taking an obscene phone call from Annie and then lying down on the bed. Go ahead, Nico. All right, y'all bear with me. I got a lot of notes here. (laughs) All right, we meet Donald Pleasance. Rest in peace to a legend. And I love how Loomis doesn't even want to refer to Michael as a man. He's just evil in his eyes. However, for Michael to be as evil, scary as Loomis makes him out, it does bother me some how quick he is to just jump out of the car at Smith Grove and not be more cautious. It's real easy to notice the goof here, but Michael very clearly has a wrench in his hand busting out this window. We're in Haddonfield now, and damn, how good is his score and the feel and the atmosphere of the town and this neighborhood? Carpenter kills it with the uh, atmosphere. Lori is dressed like a Sunday school teacher here, heading to school for some reason. Tommy Doyle is a cool little kid, but he's asking to do a lot of activities in one night. Jack-o'-lanterns, movies, popcorn, and read to the kid. I hope Lori's getting paid well. Better not be no minimum wage <laughs> crap. The loud sound is unnecessary when Michael reveals himself in the house. Just the breathing would have been perfect to me. They get it 100% right when Michael watches Lori walking down the sidewalk. I love that. I hope Loomis is on good blood pressure medicine. He is letting this psych ward guy have it, yelling at him. I will leave the... He was doing very well last night, impression to Mike. School scene with Lori and Michael is so iconic, but it does stink that it's been recreated so many times in the franchise. These kids are mean as hell to Tommy. Bullying is something that continues throughout this franchise, though, most notably in 4 when they shame Jamie Lloyd for being an orphan. That is some next-level bullying. Dustin, does that kind of bullying work? I don't know. You tell me. Michael driving a car is such bullshit, but I'll let it slide for the OG. My man is acting a little bit like John Wayne Gacy, though, creeping on Tommy Doyle, watching him walk home. Loomis continues to be hilarious in his continued state of pissed offness at the payphone. The mechanic death, though, I got to admit, is pretty pointless to me. I didn't need an explanation as to how he got the coveralls. Linda and Annie are fun characters. They bring the much-needed razzle-dazzle to this friend group. I love the Halloween theme, but is it really necessary here as Michael drives by in the car? And there's no way in hell Michael hears Annie's Speed kills comment. We get another iconic still from this movie as we see Michael standing behind the bush. I love that. Uh, We got a a fan of the show. I think it's Jesse Craft who commented on our Instagram how she gets to visit there all the time. I need to see some pictures, Jesse. Brackets one good scare line is great. But I got to ask, how did Lori not see him walking up to her? Like, she was right there. 
Kids are trick or treating at four o'clock Central Time. Come on, give me a break. Michael in the sheets in my DJ Khaled voice. Another one for iconic, memorable shots from the film. One of my complaints from 2018. Not enough of these kind of shots. 78 kills it. Annie, Annie says she's picking Lori up at 630. Bruh, she lives two houses away. Am I tripping? Just walk the fuck over there. Why do you got to pick you up? Anywho, good scenes, but I got to call out my nitpicks when I see him. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, I love that we're here at Smith Gro- uh, Smith's Grove. Uh, and I really like the scene, the dark, the rain, all of that. Uh, and I like that we – look, we don't get Michael necessarily unmasked, but he clearly doesn't have a mask on. And that was so funny – to me, because throughout the franchise, people complain about, you know, anytime Michael isn't wearing his mask. And I'm like, motherfucker, he ain't wearing the mask right here in 1978. So, again, it's just one of those things I think goes with the lore. I'm just not a, uh, it's just not something that I really care about because right here in the OG, we get Michael Myers without one. Uh, and, and I like the car scene. I think it's, you know, pretty horrifying. Uh, and I, you know, it's kind of funny that they get this nurse to come back. For Halloween kills like the same person, like uh, just just really cool that they did that. Anyway, um, uh, Nurse Marion, shout out to her. Actually, she returns to the franchise not once but twice. Um, <laughs> but love the scene, and and again, I know it's goofy that Michael Myers is driving this car. I know, I get it. It doesn't make sense, and I'm willing to concede that and let's and let people call it out because that's really dumb. And you know, but even Donald Pleasance. Which, by the way, shout out to Donald Pleasance. He's great from start to finish in this film. Some of the later films, his character's written a little over the top and goofy, but right here, man, it's Dr. Loomis. Just great acting all the way around. Really kind of brings the level of the movie up, in my opinion, with his performance experience, veteran actor. Um, but anyway, even, you know, you know, <laughs> maybe someone around here gave him lessons, like all that stuff. Really good stuff from, uh, from Donald Pleasance. So look. We're in Haddonfield, quote unquote, uh, but we're really in Los Angeles, California, and you can tell uh, it looks hot. Uh, <laughs> there's palm trees, uh, but you know they they do an okay job of of making me, me immerse myself in. Forget about that. But it's just fall in Haddonfield, Illinois, would be gloomy and overcast and gray, uh, and this is just you know beach weather looking to me. But anyway. Uh, this is, you know, original Laurie Strode right here. Probably the <laughs> worst portrayal of Laurie Strode, in my opinion, just because, again, Jim Lee Curtis was new, you know, and this is kind of all this stuff is new to her. You know, this is really her first big movie, and her character is written the way it's written. She performed it to the best of her ability. So couldn't have been too bad because it, you know, went on to be an iconic character in horror. Oh, she did great. Group of- Hey, hey, I'm fine with that stance too. I'm fine with that stance. Uh, love this group of friends. Uh, I totally love this group of friends, actually. Uh, Annie and Linda. And, and, and again, look, I know their dialogue is eh, but I'm willing to forgive it because it was of its time. It's the way it goes. Here we go with Sheriff Brackett, who again, we get the return to the franchise and Halloween Kills, which I thought was even cooler. Uh, everyone's entitled to one good scare is a great line. Um, and, and, you know, really the really the last thing I have here is these just have this set of scenes has some of the most iconic shots in the franchise to me behind the bush through the clothesline stopping Tommy Doyle. Like all of that stuff I think is really iconic. It makes me a little sad that a lot of these got turned into memes like Michael Myers from, from behind the bush is now a meme in our culture, which is that's man. That just kind of tells you where we're at. But again, great set of scenes. Love, I, I just, it's just so simple. We're, we're, we are telling a very simple story with this movie. Bad man, bad man on the loose. Now he's going to try to kill people. Um, I, and Nico, were you saying that you didn't like the speed kills line or not? Like I couldn't quite make out exactly what you, I mean, it's totally fine if you don't, because I know a lot of people don't. So that that's, that's why I'm asking. I don't care if she says it. I just don't believe Michael would have heard it. Yeah, that's that. Okay. That's a fair, very fair criticism. Sorry, go ahead, Dustin. Yeah, no. Um, I love Dr. Loomis referring to Michael as it. Like, it just drives home that he's not a person. He's a monster. He's evil personified. Like, that. that's great. I also love that that nurse is chain smoking. That girl was ripping heaters like a middle-aged construction worker. Big fan. 
Uh, <laughs> I like the score while they pull up and see all the loonies wandering about. That was good shit. Um, and then when Michael slaps the window to break it, there's a very visible wrench in his palm to ensure that the glass breaks. Like they tried to paint it skin color to hide it, but you can definitely see it. Now I didn't know it was there, but I read that that was there. And so I looked for it. And if you look for it, yep, yeah, he's got a fucking wrench in his hand. Uh, this is one of those things, man. It's like, you kind of want to pick and pick and choose what you want to nitpick. Those trees are awfully green for it to be nearly November in Illinois, but I can't forgive it. I can't forgive that. I don't hold that against this movie at all. Uh, it is a little hard to believe, though, that if Michael was, what, six when he was taken away, that one, he'd know how to get there, and two, remember the house he lived in. But again, that's just one of those movie shortcuts that you have to deal with. Um, I've got other issues in this one other than just that one, like immediately after. Um, well, I do love the shot of Michael looking at the school from outside, you know, near the car. But again, how did he know? How did he know that that's the school that he needed to be at? And that's where that's the classroom that Lori was in. Like, that's crazy to me. Uh, and we want to talk about the different times, like the sign of the times. This guy would be on a registry these days if he just camped out near a school watching kids wearing a mask like that's fucking insane to me. Uh, it's really weird when Michael slams on the brakes after she says speed kills. Like, it, I don't have a problem with the line itself. But like you said, Nico, how did she, how did he? There's no way he heard that, first of all, because, yeah, his windows were down. But she didn't say it that loud. Like, he's still in a moving car. And so and he was far enough away. There's no way he heard it. She didn't yell it. But also, I just don't like, uh, you know, him slamming on the brakes the way he did. It's like, ooh, that didn't add anything to me. It didn't make him any more any more creepy or scary that he slammed on the brakes because he didn't do a damn thing about it. He rode off like a little bitch. Uh, I absolutely love the scene where the girls are walking down the sidewalk and they see Michael watching them. That's probably my favorite shot. My like my one favorite still for the movie is Michael like peeking from around the bushes there. I don't know why. It just, I just love that. Uh, and I love that he disappears. That's that's going to be a theme in my notes is I love how the shape continues to just appear and then disappear into the shadows. It's perfect. I like the jump scare right after that when she's kind of walking backwards and looking down the sidewalk trying to see where he went. And then she bumps into the cop. Phenomenal. And then his line, iconic. Everyone deserves a good scare on Halloween. That's just that's great. Now, I know I said I like how he disappeared around the bush but I hate how he disappears into the sheets on the clothesline there. Isn't that her hallucinating though? That's not really him there, right? I always took that as she was hallucinating that. Why was she hallucinating? I don't know. I mean, was I just, on, I, that's, was, that's the way I always took it the, because she had seen him before. On the drugs? Maybe on the marijuanas. On the marijuanas. I mean, it was 1978 by guess. Well, she smokes it later. Girl, yeah. These girls do the marijuana cigarettes later, but <laughs> I, I don't know. I didn't take it as a, as a hallucination, but it, it might have been. But if it was, then they should have fucking explained that. She didn't have any other hallucinations, I guess, is so, my, my, my issue with it. You you mentioned loving how he disappeared in one scene and not in this one. Totally understand that. But I do think, maybe unintentionally, Dustin, they're setting up the ending where he just, poof, he's gone. Like, he can come well, and go as he pleases. Like, that's the, the only thing I can think of. Well, here, here's the reason I don't like that, though. is because she was looking the whole time. Like the camera cut from him to her and you. back to him and he's okay. gone. Sure. But she never broke her gaze. So to me, the way they should have shot that, they could have kept the exact same sequence of what they did. She's looking out the window. Then the phone rings. She goes over, answers the phone. When she goes back, he's gone. That makes sense. She took her eyes off him. At the sure. end, when he falls out the window after Loomis emptied the fucking clip on him, <laughs> we don't see Like he falls out and they're inside the house. So by the time they get to the window, he's gone. This okay, time, like fair. she, she didn't take her eyes off of him, and he just poofy disappears. That's that's probably my biggest issue with this movie. If I'm being honest, is just that didn't make sense to me. But if it's hallucination, then yeah, it does make sense. But it doesn't make sense that she's hallucinating because I don't know that she's on and maybe any that's hallucinations. maybe that's just my head cannon trying to explain it away because of that exact problem that you just stated. So yeah, and and that makes perfect sense. But yeah, I mean, this is. Another solid set of scenes. It's just it does happen to have my biggest nitpick. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're at the halfway point. Scene three. It's now 630, and Lori, with Pumpkin in tow, is seen getting in the car with Annie. 
We cut to Loomis arriving to the Haddonville, Haddonfield Cemetery and discover Judith's tombstone is missing from her plot. Another cut takes us back to the car as Penny and Lori are partaking in the marijuanas. They panic as they pull up to Nichols Hardware as we establish it has been robbed and that the sheriff is indeed Annie's father. Don't worry, Pops, that's definitely not the devil's lettuce you smell. The girls drive away and discuss Ben Tramer while being tailed by the drivingest damn serial killer ever all the way to the Doyle's house. And we watch Annie also enter the Wallace house across the street for her babysitting duties as well. Loomis meets up with the sheriff bracket and they investigate Michael's old house. They find a dead mutilated dog in the house while Loomis gives some backstory on Michael, establishing him as pure evil and having the blackest eyes. Looking at you, H2O. Brackett isn't buying Loomis' shit, but agrees to at least patrol the streets while Loomis says he will wait at the Myers' house, expecting his return. But sorry, Loomis, the return of Michael Myers isn't until part four, so you got to wait a little while. Go ahead. All right, i got to start with a question. Can someone from the 70s who's a listener please chime in? Were people really right. trick-or-treating this damn early? Oh, come on, Mike. It's not me, you <laughs> motherfucker. And that was Dustin I, this I didn't time. Say that? Did you say come on, Mike? <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. that's funny. But that was Dustin Mike this time. So often. Mike does it so often. Nico, Nico just assumed it was. <laughs> Dude, I got, but I got my notes pulled up, so I couldn't see y'all's faces. My bad. Uh, okay. Anywho, all right. Loomis is underwhelming with this reaction, seeing Judith Myers' tombstone missing. This should raise huge red flags to him in the Haddonfield Police Department, right? Where's all that high blood pressure energy at now, Doctor Loomis? Don't fear the Reaper. Great song. I can understand you getting lost in the sauce listening to it, but I don't know how these girls don't notice this car tailgating them. Negative 78 score for their Madden awareness rating right now. And just like Brian mentioned, the marijuana's. It smells terrible. How does a sheriff... Now, how is he unable to smell it? Dewey would never. Shout out to Dustin. How did Michael break into this hardware store this fast, manage to get in the car and trail these girls? Michael must be running off, you know, run off screen like all those TikToks that show him. And speaking of TikTok, the one I saw that pointed out Michael looking both ways before he makes his turn has me crying at this scene now. I can't watch this scene normally anymore. I do like Annie and Lori's conversation in the car. It seems like a genuine talk girls would have. And, you know, like Mike mentioned with Deborah Hill, shout out to her. She did a great job with the dialogue. Relatability is very important to me in these movies we review. Another unnecessary Halloween score as Michael drives behind them again. How have these girls not picked up on this by now? I'm increasing the negative, uh, the Madden rating for these girls, 197.8 now. If y'all pick up on what that number is, I appreciate that. Great shot here as Michael watches Annie walk onto the porch from behind the tree. And good call, John Carpenter, not showing the dead dog. Horror fans whine more about seeing a fake dead animal than people, which still blows my mind. Very unnecessary jump scare as the window is broken. Incredibly uncanny. It just so happens when Loomis and Brackett get upstairs. Could it do without that? Loomis delivers his the blackest eyes dialogue to perfection. You can feel the fear Loomis has of Michael, and I love it. I like that Loomis and the graveyard attendant, like, realizing the tombstone was gone. Like, that was very ominous. Sets us up for something good. Um, creates good tension. I also love that this is the second review in a row that features Don't Fear the Reaper when the killer is so close by. Like, we talked about that on Scream when Billy was climbing in the window. And then here, uh, Michael's driving right behind them. I love that. Uh, Annie's dad, like you said, he's got to be the worst. This is so funny, Nico. I have this, this is my direct quote in my notes. He's got to be the worst cop ever. How do you not smell the devil's lettuce? Dewey would never. So shout out to the goat, Dewey Riley. I like how they shot Michael driving by Loomis. Like that scene, they shot it from in front of, you know, Lo Loomis is facing the camera and he turns his head perfectly as the car drives by, like to explain why he didn't see him or why he didn't notice it. I love that. Even though he was walking down the sidewalk in the direction that Michael came from. So if he'd noticed that that car was missing, he'd probably be on the lookout for it. I think he might've seen it. I don't know, but the way they shot that was perfect. Now, I don't know why Michael had to kill the damn dog. Come on, man. To quote, Coming to America, damn shame what they did to that dog. I love how dark it is here. It's really great, uh, really great mood and atmosphere when Loomis is in the Myers house. And this is what I was talking about earlier that I'm sure you guys are going to mention. But, you know, the dark lighting comes from necessity. A lot of times in this movie, the crew didn't have enough money for more lights. And it worked out great. Like, it worked out absolutely great. Because even in a lot of movies that have a bigger budget, 
when it is dark and it is nighttime, they still light up the, the characters' faces so you can see them more. I love that they couldn't afford to do that in this. It makes it so much better. And the last thing I have, Loomis' uh, monologue here, iconic. Like, this is just top-notch stuff. It gave us some, you know, some great lines that we hear in other Halloween movies down the road. They actually, uh, did they sample it in the in the newer ones, or did they use AI to, like, regenerate or a voice actor? I don't remember. But, you know, we get that callback in the, in the newer ones. I really like this set of scenes a lot. Go ahead, Nico. If I'm not mistaken, in 2018, didn't they have the same guy from Kills with the voice do those uh, tapes that the podcast we're listening to? The podcasters, excuse me. I I think that voice in Kills is a different guy. Okay, okay. okay. But yeah, I know yeah. I know in 2018 they have like a similar voice. Yeah, you know, recordings yeah, of Loomis right. and all that. I'd mm-hmm. have to yeah. you know go back and research all yeah. that. But yeah, yeah. So. I like that this set of scenes kind of takes us from the the uh, not so horrible stuff to like, all right, we're about to get into the really dark and and moody and atmospheric stuff that I always talk about. When I think about mood and atmosphere, the line I use so much, you know, this movie's really where I get it from, <laughs> and I like that this set of scenes kind of takes us in there. Dustin touched on it a lot, but you know, go, go back to the beginning. First of all, that's a big fucking pumpkin. Like, I've always thought that since the first time I saw this movie. I don't think I've ever carved a pumpkin that big in my whole fucking life. Like, like we carve pumpkins every year now, but I I don't remember ever seeing one. I mean, that's like James and the Giant Peach big, except it's a pumpkin. Anyway, um, so, that you know, that's a pretty lucky kid, Tommy Doyle. Ends up being, although as we find out, Tommy Doyle wasn't so lucky in either timeline. Because one, he's nuts, and two, he's a drunk. So anyway, um, <laughs> but I like... I do like the, the, the fact that they're being of the time. So 1978, these kids are smoking weed in the car. Like that, I mean, that's just like very normal thing. They don't shy away from it. You know, even earlier horror films, there's sex and gore and all this stuff, but showing drug use, pretty, not taboo, but pretty uncommon, even in horror. And so here we are, we're getting innocent high school teenagers, quote unquote, smoking weed. One's dad is a cop, like the cop of all cops. And so I really like that, that, you know, to me, again, they're written like realistic teenagers of their time. And I, and I like that. Shout out to Don't Fear the Reaper, one of my favorite songs of all time. Um, love that it's playing here. And, and, and I love that it continues to get used without the franchise. I think that's what makes the first one or going back to the first one so fun is like, ah, okay, this is why it's this way now and all this other stuff. So I really like that. Look, Loomis is so freaking good in this set of scenes, man. And I, and I actually think, Sheriff Brackett does a great job of playing the straight man off of him. Like to an outsider who's not invested in this time, you know, in this franchise, Loomis probably does seem like a crazy person. Like, you know, he, he he's just kind of rambling incoherently calling him, e- you know, the, the personification of evil, you know, the devil's eyes, the blackest eyes, like all of that stuff would probably seem like the Kramblins of, or the Kramblins, Jesus Christ, the ramblings of a crazy person. Uh, <laughs> And, and, you know, he's telling the truth, but if you're Sheriff Brackett, yeah, I probably wouldn't take that super, you know, head on. I'd be, uh, doubtful as well. I love the lighting. This is so perfect to me. When I think of a horror movie, this is what I think of. It's, it's barely lit. They use like a blue hue to like basically signify the moon, for lack of a better term, like really cheap budgeting tricks that they had no choice but to do to make these sets of scenes work. Once this movie goes dark, it, it, I just, I love, I'm so invested. I love every bit of it. I think they do a great job. And I love this set of scenes because we get the one of not, not the only one of the most iconic Loomis, uh, monologues ever. And I just, and we get the teenagers being teenagers. And, and I, I think it's really good. All right, fellas, next set of scenes. We see Lori and Annie babysitting Tommy and Lindsay, respectively. Lester, the Wallace's family dog, is noticeably irritated at what we finally see is Michael, who is now targeting and stalking Annie. Tommy sees him through the windows and probably has his first hope that evil dies tonight, but instead we'll have to settle for pumpkin pies tonight, as Lori does not believe my man at all. By the way, am I the only one that thinks Tommy looks like a young Seth Green? Just throwing that out there. Dude, Seth Green I does. Same thing. He would have that been very true. He would have been a great older Tommy Doyle. Anyway, 
we see Annie show some psychotic behavior. She splashes a little butter on her shirt and is so disgusted that she strips down to her underwear and steals Mr. Wallace's clearly dirty shirt hanging on the door. We're going uh, button up panties and socks the rest of the evening. And I'm going to guess uh, Mrs. Wallace would not be super thrilled if she came home to that. In more psychotic behavior, we are now washing all of her clothes with an exuberant amount of detergent before somehow being locked from the outside in a laundry room with no electricity, but the washing machine works. Annie decides to unload Lindsay onto Lori so she can pick up her boyfriend, Paul. But Mikey Mike has other plans as he gives her the old one-two as she gets in her car. Evil cries tonight as Tommy is once again not believed by Lori after seeing Michael carrying Annie's body around the house. We cut back to the Myers house as Dr. Loomis is pleased with himself after scaring Lonnie's ass away from the door. <laughs> Sheriff Brackett pops up and needs more than fancy talk, gets it, and then agrees to stay with him through the night, damning him for letting Michael go. All right, bear with me. I got a decent amount on here again. But there's no way in hell I'm babysitting at a house with a whole ass German Shepherd. I'm a former mailman. I have a built-in fear of dogs now. You probably know this. Shout out to Annie for hooking Lori up with her crush. That's a good friend. Lori should be appreciative. Another one. Michael outside the house as Tommy sees him. Elite still might be one of my favorites. However, it is Halloween, Tommy. That could have been literally anyone dressed up standing there. Maybe a little bit of overreaction. And Brian, I'm glad you stressed this. Annie gets almost completely naked because she got butter on her shirt. A bit dramatic in my opinion. Lindsay Wallace doesn't listen for shit and John... Why would you show a dog being killed on screen? Honestly, I'm surprised. I don't see him getting more grief over it. Annie washing clothes over some butter on her shirt is so ridiculous, man. But real talk, is this whole scene even necessary? She isn't killed out there. There's no memorable stills. The door magically shuts. And how are you not able to unlock that door from the inside? How loud is that phone to where Annie can hear it ring in a whole ass different building? How she gets stuck is hilarious, too. Hey, that phone being it, loud is legit, like, of the time. Those old damn phones are loud as shit. <laughs> All right. It took little Lindsay Wallace next to no effort to get Annie's foot free. Come on, man. This is this is just bad, right? John redeems himself here with some excellent visuals of Michael in the door behind Annie as she's on the phone. What, that's another one of my favorite stills. Ladies, y'all annoy me hating on men for being horny when y'all are just as horny. See this scene of Annie as an example? I'm just a messenger. Hot take, that bit of sound as Michael stands up behind the car as Annie and Lindsay walk past is very unnecessary. There are a lot of unnecessary uses of sound in this movie, in my opinion. Lori is such a prude. Why does she want to cancel her date with her crush? Seriously, real real question. How is she friends with girls like Annie and Linda? She's like complete opposite. My girl Annie is aching for a quaking here. The car door is locked but unlocked when she gets back. Madden awareness is staying strong at a negative 197.8. The sound that plays as Michael reveals himself is perfect, but the loud sound as Annie's head slides down is unnecessary, in my opinion. Another elite scene as Tommy watches Michael carrying Annie's body inside the house. Tommy has one of the most high-pitched screams I've ever heard. I couldn't understand a damn thing he was yelling. Loomis wins the Man Fuck Them Kids Award, scaring the kids on the Myers porch. Shout out to the legend. And Brackett, I feel like he has a lot of nerve blaming Loomis here for Michael getting free. He didn't do none of that, but, you know... That's all I got, but I feel like Bracket was tripping a little bit. Yeah, uh, again, this scene where Annie and Lori are on the phone with each other gets a little annoying to me, too. Uh, it's one of the very few scenes that I just, like, wouldn't mind skipping upon a rewatch. You know, and and I get you have to have some regular stuff in with this quote-unquote spooky stuff, but I think we're far enough in the movie now where some of this probably didn't really need to be in here. Uh, and it's just a really, honestly, it's a, in hindsight, whether they realize it or not, it's an excuse to get Annie half naked on screen. And I think that's exactly what it is. You know, we talk about the butter, her getting basically down to her underwear just to remove a single stain. Like that's a little crazy to me. Uh, so I'm with everyone there. Like, I, you know, no, 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 no defense from this way. Even the stuff with Lindsay Wallace getting her out, like that stuff, I, it doesn't really set up anything. I guess the only thing I could really think of to defend it is this, like, this reliance on, oh, it's going to be okay. Like, uh, she got out of it. She wasn't killed. Annie's probably going to live. Maybe like a false sense of security, for lack of a better term. But, but yeah. then we get, and I, 
And, and by the way, Nico, you mentioned it, these shots where Tommy can see what's happening from a distance. Love them. The visuals are incredible. I love the way that shot. Uh, and I actually really like everything about Annie's kill. Like I like Annie's, like I like all the stuff in the car. I think it's really good. Um, trying to get a little quote unquote creative, I guess, because, you know, you just don't want to just stab everybody all the time. You know, you want to get a little creative. So, uh, but again, the best part of, of this set of scenes is Tommy Doyle and his, his, you know, him freaking out finally kind of to me kicks the movie in overdrive because we're getting an on, you know, we're getting an on screen kill. One of the main characters, like really love everything about this set of scenes because we start to kick it up. And finally, this is where I'm so mixed on Sheriff Brackett as a character in this movie and franchise, really, because I, I mean, I get like, Loomis sounds like a crazy man, but at some point, like, this is the guy that was this man's doctor for all this time. Why are we not taking this threat seriously? He began, you know, bracket blaming Loomis really started to get really annoying to me. Uh, and I think, you know, I'm glad that bracket was brought back and I think the acting is great, but I always forget every time I watch this movie how much I don't really like his character in this particular movie. Go ahead. So we get a great shot of the shape outside Annie's house, and then I love that he disappeared when Tommy tried to show her because, it, you know, number one, like I said, I like how the shape keeps appearing and disappearing into the shadows. That's great. But also it adds another layer. Like, it wasn't tired at the time, I'm sure, but now we kind of get annoyed when nobody believes the kid or nobody believes the girl. Uh, but this, in, in this instance, it really works. Now, this dog dying... I can kind of justify self-defense, but damn, Mike, two dogs in an hour? You're making Michael Vick look like a PETA poster boy. What the fuck are we doing here? Uh, talk about a piss-poor design. The laundry room is outside this house? Hell no. You know how old that would get trying to do laundry? And if you're like me, sometimes you wait until, oh, shit, I have to do laundry. And so I, I just, the first thought I came, or the thought, first thought that came to my mind was, what if you've got to do laundry because you're out of draws for the next day for work, and it's a damn thunderstorm. Like, God, that's going to piss me off. So, no, I'd move. Fuck this house. I love Michael showing up and looking at Annie through uh, talking on the phone as she's pacing, and then he disappears again. Uh, some more good shit there. Get a great jump scare when Michael pops up in the back seat and strangles Annie. But she should have realized something was up. Like, the door was locked, so she went to get the keys, and then it was unlocked. Like she came back, she didn't stick a key in the damn door. She just reached for it and opened it. That's a red flag. I'd be like, whoa, what the fuck? Let me not get in this car. Let me look around first. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. And then, speaking of doors and locks, how the hell did Michael open the door while he was carrying Annie's corpse? Okay. Like he just walked up to the door, didn't reach for it, didn't bend down, nothing. Just like, didn't even kick it open with his foot. Like, he just walked in and it opened. That was a miss for me. And then I don't know why Loomis crouched and hid to yell at the kids. Like, he's an adult. These kids shouldn't be there. He's got a cop with him. Like, he could have just said, hey, kids, kick rocks. That was a weird choice to have him hide and cower behind the bushes. But him saying, hey, Lonnie, get your ass away from there. That's a very memorable line. I'll give him that. Like, I, I see that line so often in my head sometimes when <laughs> I'll be watching something and I see somewhere where they shouldn't be. I'll just say, get your ass away from there. And so I, I really like that. But, um, yeah, I mean, we're getting amped up into the action more so. I mean, there's a, there's not a ton of kills in this movie to begin with. But, you know, we got a dog dead. We got one of our major players dead here. So, yeah, this is a very good set of scenes. All right, ladies, we got two more sets of scenes here. We cut back to the Wallace house as horny-ass Linda and Bob pull up drinking and driving in the shagging wagon, only to find the house empty. Where's Annie? Well, she's totally gone, and it's coitus o'clock. And about one to two minutes later... They're all finished up and smoking in someone else's house and bed. Bob follows up by going downstairs to get a beer, where Michael kills him by pinning his ass to the wall with a very large kitchen knife. Michael then poses as Bob in a ghost costume, complete with Bob's glasses. He goes upstairs to meet Linda, who asks if there's anything he sees that he may like. Annoyed with no answer, Linda decides to call Lori just five minutes from the last time she called Lori to find out where Annie and Paul are, because patience doesn't really seem to be her thing either. Michael strangles Linda out with the phone cord while on the phone. And while thinking it's a joke at first, Lori gets worried and decides to head over there and leave the kids at home. 
Back at the old Myers murder mansion, Loomis suddenly out of nowhere spots the car they've been looking for, apparently right within eye view, about 100 yards away. We cut back to Lori, who is finally heading over to the Wallace's house, where Michael has quickly staged all of the bodies in preparation for her arrival, complete with self-opening doors and even dragging in Judith's Judith headstone that is now sitting on the bed with a dead Linda. Screaming, Lori flees to the hallway as Michael appears and slashes her arm, causing her to fall over the stairway banister. And the next set of scenes is the ending. Go ahead, Nico. All right, we got to address this. Bob delivers an extremely inappropriate pedophiliac comment about ripping Lindsay's clothes off. Yes. Holy shit. Yes. And Linda doesn't even care. That's a that's a wild line of dialogue, man. Uh, I never noticed it either until this watch. I was like, bro, what the fuck? Okay. I have to compliment the blue lighting. The movie looks so damn good. I can't compliment Carpenter enough. It looks fantastic. This is the fakest sex scene I've ever seen. Linda is moaning before Bob even gets on top of her. And then my man empties a clip within 10 seconds of going back to battle. Not really an athlete. The Bob kill is pretty tame by horror standards today. <laughs> the Bob kill is pretty tame by horror standards today, but it works so well for this movie. Michael's head tilt staring at what he's done is just perfection. Michael with a sheet over his head is some top-notch improvisation. And PJ Souls does a great job here in this very awkward situation. Another great piece of music as Michael grabs Linda from behind and strangles her to death. My man Michael does need to work on his conditioning, though. Bro is huffing and puffing after a few moments of energy exertion. But him holding that phone is such a cool shot, so I'll allow it. Lindsay and Tommy are sleeping in the same bed. What kind of babysitting is Lori doing? I know they're young, but come on, no way in hell any parents are cool with that. Loomis finally notices the car. I got to give Loomis the old negative 197.8 awareness rating on Madden now himself. Score, mood, and lighting is perfect as Lori walks over to the Wallace house. Masterclass in filmmaking. I love the visual of Annie on the bed with Judas Tombstone and the pumpkin. Bob and Linda's body reveal, though, I could do without that. It's pretty cheesy. Michael whiffs stabbing Lori, and I hate to agree with cinema sense here, but seriously, how does Lori not have a broken arm, leg, or neck after that fall onto the stairs? Uh, I mean, I know she's limping, but I don't know. I feel like she should have a more significant injury than that. And then this break blocking off that door, that's pretty convenient. Maybe I'm just nitpicking a little too much, but I do got to give Lori her props. She's got a solid punch breaking that glass with no hand protection. That's all I got. <laughs> yeah, I mean... Linda and Bob are, without a doubt, the horniest people in this movie. I know you mentioned Annie, but I don't know, man. It didn't get a whole lot worse than this. Bob was so horny, he makes the most pedophilic comment maybe in horror movie history. Like, I can't imagine. That was tough. I mean, don't even give me a different time. That is that is tough right there. Um, but, I, you know, the sex scene with Linda and Bob is almost irrelevant because of what it sets up. Again, what I mentioned earlier, this false sense of safety, security, like, we're young, we're wild, we're free, not to quote that song, but like, you know, young, wild, and free for a reason. We're having sex in this house, you know, no one's home, blah, blah, blah. And and I like that it creates that because, first of all, get Linda on the phone, and I don't mind the phone cord kill. I know a lot of people say it's tame, and look, again, they weren't trying to be gorehounds here in this movie, plus I didn't have the budget for it anyway. So you got to come up with creative ways to kill people. And I think, you know, like, I think all that shown real, like, uh, really, okay, really like the struggle there. Uh, but look, the Bob kill. Is it realistic? Could a knife hold up Bob in this way onto the wall? Probably not. <laughs> Take a really big fucking knife, maybe a machete of some kind. But man, I don't care. It's fucking iconic. I love it. And not so much to kill but the performance of Michael Myers here to just do the head tilt. Fucking iconic, classic character moment. So much so that in wrestling, you know, Kane did it later on in his career. This is where he got it from, you know. And, you know, The Undertaker and Kane actually stole a lot of stuff from, from, from Michael Myers as far as this movie goes. Uh, but just love the, the nuances that we get here. Uh, you know, Bob and Linda's deaths. Two of my favorites in the movie because they make sense. You know, why are you, you know, it's like the strangers. Why are you doing this? Because they're home and some, you know, some more brilliant filmmaking. While I don't think Laurie Strode is like the best final girl of all time. She may be the OG, but she's not the best final girl of all time. Just 
because she's so unaware. Like she, she just still isn't buying this boogeyman thing. Even, you know, yeah, she's going to check on her friends, but she's not believing Tommy Doyle. And I'm sorry, but in the last set of scenes, Tommy's screaming just incredibly high pitched here and you're still not believing him. Uh, I, again, Laurie Strode, not my favorite, but great movie making here. The music, the lighting, how we're tracking Laurie from house to house. Really like that. Um, and again, now we're getting to the final showdown, Michael and Laurie in a battle. And as unrealistic as this is, I do like the fact that they gave this particular character who seems like the weakest, most timid of the group. I like that they're giving her this final battle, kind of showing that strength can come from wherever. So that's all I had on that set of scenes. So the shadow moving across the wall while they're having sexy time, that's a great shot. Um, I kind of think I would notice like the, the, you know, the shadow was projecting on the wall kind of in front of them. So maybe old boy would, uh, notice, but then again, he's just trying to get a nut off. So maybe not, uh, now, I did have something in my notes about them smoking in, uh, you know, someone else's bed. But then I tried to remember, this is 78. This is a different time. People smoked a lot more back then than they do now. Maybe they smoked it in the house already so the smell wouldn't be noticeable. Like, I certainly remember growing up and going to people's houses and, like, their houses smell like cigarettes and so because they smoked inside. So maybe maybe that's not a big of a deal as it is to us because in 2023, it's crazy to think people smoke inside their houses. Uh we get an elite jump scare when Michael comes out of the pantry and chokes Bob out and then stabs him, pins him to the wall. That was an elite kill too. I don't care what anyone says. So yeah, it's probably not plausible. Probably wouldn't hold his body weight up. I mean, he would have really had to drive that knife in there. Pause, but it was cool. It was a good shot. And I like how they show, they pan to the feet to show that he's still elevated. Michael going into the bedroom and wearing a sheet though. Not my favorite. It's really random. Uh, and why Linda sound like she's getting her back blown out when she dies? God, I hope I don't make sounds like that when I die. Please, God. But and if I do, just let me die alone. No one in the room. Uh, I'm not sure how Loomis is just now seeing that car. But OK, right. like that car right. seems to have been there all night because Michael's been there all night. And like I said earlier, Loomis is on the lookout for this car because he knows the car that Michael stole. And that's a pretty recognizable car with the logos on the decals on the door there. So, but whatever, you can kind of forgive that, I guess. Get great tension as Lori walks in Annie's house and the score there is a huge, huge reason why we can't give enough props to Carpenter for the score in this movie. Uh, while it's awesome in theory that he put the tombstone in bed with her, that tombstone is way too clean to have been real. Like, it's not believable. There's no way he dug that damn thing up and it looks like it just came, you know, from the tombstone factory or wherever the fuck they make tombstones. I don't know. But I just did that. It doesn't work for me. I wish they, they would have dirtied it up a little bit. Uh, and then Bob's body swinging down like that. How? Why? Like, why was his body hanging upside down and, and just happened to swing down like that when it did? I don't know. That's a nitpick for sure, but it stood out to me. And then the last thing I have Mike appearing out of the shadow was awesome. Like when Lori's all distraught and crying and stuff, him just appearing in that shadow. That's a great iconic shot as well, but he missed the fuck was that? He swiped at her and just cut her damn sleeve. No, this man's killed multiple people already in this movie. He's killed two damn dogs. And she's a stationary target, not moving any misses. The moment was not too big. I'm not buying that. He didn't piss down his leg. He just <laughs> fucking missed. I don't know. Don't like that. I mean, I get it. it sets us up for our ending. He, we weren't ready to go home yet, so we need something to get us through. But, you know, he knocked a plant over out when he was spying on uh, Linda when she was taking her clothes off. Or what, that was Annie. When Annie was get, taking her clothes off because of the butter, he knocked the plant off the hook and it fell and made a sound. To me, it would have been better if he knocked something over as he's trying to get to her. And she heard it, and that's how she got away, and she just happened to stumble over the banister. I don't know. It would have been more believable than him swiping at a stationary target and missing. That's not that's not the Michael Myers I know. Yeah, Dustin, it's funny you mentioned the headstone because I agree with you. That's probably like the silliest part of this movie and a movie that has some silly parts. But Carpenter and others have just kind of explained, like, is Michael Myers human? Is he not human? We don't know. Like, it's a loophole they can get away with because, you know, he's, quote, unquote, the shape. 
you know, is he a real guy? Is he not a real guy? Like, I think they kind of use that to excuse themselves out of what I think was just like a cheap, like. No, no, no. Like the headstone being there is fine. Right. It's just how clean it was because we saw sure. the grave earlier. We saw how, you know, it was dug up. The tombstone was in the ground. And so also, there was a speck of dirt on that bitch. And those they things are, are heavy, heavy as so, fuck. <laughs> they are. But, you know, again, like you, this is where you mentioned that uh, is he human, is he not comes into play. I can forgive that. Like one man right. lifting a tombstone and sure. hauling it around and taking it inside and putting it on the bed. I can I can excuse his superhuman strength. Whoop, whoop. I just can't excuse how <laughs> clean it is. <laughs> All right, you guys uh, ready for the ending? This is it. 1978 Halloween. This is it. After easily busting some glass with her palm, Lori manages to barely get out of the Wallace house alive. She slides her gimp ass back to the door of the house, but finds that she's lost her keys to the front door when she fell over the stairway banister. Hate it when that happens. Props to her for actually locking the kids in the house, though. Tommy sleepily lets her in the house, only to find that there's an evil guy tonight. As Lori orders Tommy and Lindsay to hide and tries to use the telephone, <laughs> to, tries to use the telephone for help. Bone is dead as fuck. Michael sneaks in through the window and attacks her again, but finds himself quickly stabbed in the neck with a knitting needle. Thinking he's dead for some reason, Lori staggers upstairs to check on the children. But like Rocky Balboa, Mike is back and ready for another round. She tells the children to hide in the bathroom while Lori hides in the bedroom closet. But peekaboo, Mikey's found you. Thinking quick, however, Lori stabs him in the eye with a wire hanger, causing Michael to drop the knife, which Lori uses to stab him in the chest. She promptly tells Tommy and Lindsay to go down the street to a neighbor's house to call the police. After they leave, like Mike mentioned, the undertaker, I mean Michael, rises once again and approaches an unsuspecting Lori who is just chilling with her back to him yet again. Loomis sees the children running from the house and goes to investigate, catching Michael attempting to strangle Lori. Lori snatches Michael's mask off, giving us a shot of Tony Moran, distracting him as, I mean, come on, he's got to put that shit back on, right? Loomis shoots Michael six times, knocking him off the balcony. Lori asks Loomis if that was the boogeyman, which Loomis confirms. Loomis walks to the balcony and looks down to see that Michael has vanished. A resigned Loomis looks out into the night as Lori sobs in terror. What do you think of the ending, Nico Chen? First of all, First of all, that's not the boogeyman. The boogeyman is John Wick, and that movie came out nine years ago today. Just so <laughs> wow. you know. The boogeyman is the guy that ate worms on wrestling television. Sorry. That too. All right. J Jamie Lee Curtis, she does a good job here crying out for help. It feels real, but these neighbors ain't shit, man. Remind me to never go to Illinois. Sorry, listeners, if you're from there. <laughs> all right, JLC. I despise the way she cries out, the keys here. Oh, my God. I hate it so much. Tommy doesn't see the boogeyman this time out the window because, of course, and Brian, kudos to you for the evil evil guy tonight. That was great. All right, man, how did Michael get in this house without Lori noticing, and why is this man whiffing with a knife so much? Michael was pissing down his leg, not really being an athlete. Come on, Mike. Good call, Lori. Just drop the knife. The kids' reaction to seeing Michael is great. I got to give props to Nick Castle. I love the look of the mask and that lighting and his movement as Myers. Fantastic job. This closet scene is another iconic one. I find it hard to believe Michael struggles so much to break down some flimsy wooden doors, though. I mean, the man carried a freaking tombstone to the house. Lori with some elite marksmanship with that clothes hanger eye poke. Shout out to her. One stab and assume he's dead again. Did you forget what happened last time you assumed he was dead, Lori? I really don't understand why people love her so much for her in this role. The <sighs> innocence, I guess. Why was she sit there with her back to Michael? The Michael sit up, I love, though. And like you guys have already mentioned, I wrote down, I wish that Undertaker gong would have went off. Loomis shows up just in time and shoots him six times. I'll let Mike do the impression again. He's the Loomis on this show. And am I tripping here or does Lori say, what's the boogeyman? And not, was that the boogeyman? Subtitles say it was the boogeyman, but it doesn't sound like that to me at all. I love Michael being gone and the score playing. Great ambiguous ending. I can honestly see the vision Carpenter had with not wanting there to be more Myers movies with how this movie ends. However, I must say I'm glad we did get more of them. Well, some of them anyways. Yeah. That's all I got. Yeah, that ending line is a Mandela effect for sure, man. A lot of people remember it a bunch of different ways. Um, I actually really like this final, you know, fate or fate, Jesus Christ. I can't speak tonight. Huh. Evil dies tonight. Can't speak tonight. Anyway, uh, this final fight slash chase scene, I'm a real big fan of. 
Uh, I really like the back and forth, the original Laurie and Michael fight, um, because, you know, you mentioned the kind of stupidity and weakness of the, of the Laurie Strode character, but I think that's why this one works for me is because this is really like a David and Goliath situation. While Michael Myers isn't some towering giant, you know, he's a strong guy, man in a mask, and she's a high school teenager who doesn't know the first you know, fight move or technique at all. And I think that her her being able to kind of battle and think on her feet to the best of her ability makes it more realistic, in my opinion. People complain about her dropping the knife. I understand that. In hindsight, stupidity. But I'm not here to judge what people do in those moments. Is it dumb? Yes. Does it bother me? No. Because I do think someone that young and someone that inexperienced in life may do that in that situation. May think, oh, that you know, that's just enough. But again, she doesn't realize she's dealing with the shape. You know, she thinks she's dealing with a normal human. Uh, and, and, you know, the Michael Myers setup is so iconic. I love the way it's shot, you know, through Lori, over the show. Like, the whole thing is brilliant filmmaking. The lighting, the music, the way Michael Myers sits up, Undertaker style. I fucking love that shot. One of my favorites. And this scene in the closet is great. I, you know, clearly... With the benefit of hindsight and many years gone by now, that scene doesn't scare me. But I can imagine in the theater 1978, the suspense and tension of that scene scaring the piss out of people. Because, again, not a whole lot like it out there at that time. Uh, love the coat hanger to the eye. I think her, her thinking on her feet very quickly shows that she's not a complete moron. Uh, <laughs> how she was able to kind of do that. So I do like her character for that. And... Finally, in comes Loomis. I shot them six times, like to finally get that, you know, to get that scene. I love the ending, um, and well, you know, I really love the ending one because Laurie's continuing to cry. It's not one of those things like, you know, like some of the final girls now. You know, they're kind of badass and, and and brave and strong, and I I love all that. But Laurie just doesn't know what the fuck just happened. Uh, <laughs> she is still in some state of shock, and it clearly shows. And I love the cliffhanger ending. Love the music. Love the, was that the boogeyman? Well, yes, I believe it was. And then the shot over the balcony with the music playing. Michael's gone. I love that shot. I love the ending. And, you know, I know Nico, you know, maybe Nico doesn't feel this way because he likes Halloween 28, likes Halloween Kills. But someone on the show had mentioned before, if that's the only movie you got in this franchise, okay, great ending. What, you know, was he a human? Was he not a human? Okay. You know, we don't know. What a great way to go out, in my opinion. Uh, that's, I love the franchise, but we were answering questions no one was asking, in my opinion. This ending is really fucking perfect to this movie. Man, I couldn't agree with that more. This is the, the debate that I have all the time, uh, with Brian is like, yeah, we got some good ones. You know, coming after this, uh, we got Halloween 2018. We got Rob Zombie's first one. Uh, Halloween kills. Got part four, Halloween kills. But I would have been fine not having those if this one ends the way this one is. You know, if this is a one off because it's, it's so dude, good. Dude, it's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. Yep. Like you said, we're answering questions we don't need. And then we find out, oh, he's got another sister. You know, it's like all this other shit. We got a fucking cult. Um, I had to say that because I know Brian. Uh, the first thing I have on this set of scenes is what the fuck kind of neighbor. Just looks out the blinds and sees a girl screaming like that and just turns the lights back off. Like, I'm assuming that neighbor knows Lori. This seems like a tight knit community. You got to leave a flaming, uh, flaming bag of dog shit on that doorstep as soon as this shit's over. Flaming bag of dog shit. It reminded me, reminded me of Billy Madison. And just, I was like, we call the shit yeah. poop in my head as soon as you said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can just see the, the person that opened the blinds and then closed them, putting it out with their boots, Ted. <laughs> Um, I love how, or I don't know how Michael popped up from behind the couch like that. I could be mistaken, but wasn't that over near the phone? Like, wasn't the phone over behind the couch there? So she just came from that direction. And now all of a sudden he's there. I don't know. And also when she saw that the window was open, she definitely should have turned the lights back on. Like this guy is clearly a shapeshifter. Or, you know, he's a shadow man. Turn the lights back on. It gives you a better chance. Uh, she stabs him in the neck with a sewing needle and then just drops the knife. To quote the late, great Kobe Bryant, job's not finished. Is the job finished? I don't think so. Mamba forever. She should have picked that shit back up. 
It's hilarious to me that Michael uh, shakes on that closet door for as long as he does before he finally punches through it. It's like, I don't know why, but to me, it's, it should have been one to two shakes. Oh, it's shut. It's locked. She's not going to let me in. Let me just punch through it now. Instead, she, that shit went on what, for what felt like forever. Then Lori uh, stabs him in the or she stabs Michael with his knife. But that knife is clean as a whistle after. And then she drops the damn knife again. I get it. Zombieland hadn't been out yet, but that's one of the rules, man. Double tap. You can't 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 just assume that he's dead. But like Mike said, I don't have a problem with that, actually. Like, I don't have a problem with her doing that at all, because logic as a high school kid, you probably think this guy's dead. OK, I'm finally safe. I stabbed him. He hasn't moved in a while. So I can forgive that for sure. Jamie Lee Curtis has said, though, that that's the question she gets off or asked most often is why did you drop the knife? So that's kind of funny. Uh, then Loomis lights his ass up and then the shape disappears again. I absolutely love that. That kid says, you know, you can't kill the boogeyman. And then six shots later, they're right. So good ending. Like you said, Mike, it would have been perfect as a standalone. I don't hate all the movies at all. I do hate some of them, but, um, yeah, it's, it's a, for a standalone, this is all we're reviewing is this movie. So as for this movie being what it is really good. Uh, you know, you mentioned that the JLC gets asked that question the most. One, I remember watching an interview with her. I want to say it was with like Entertainment Tonight or whoever. When they asked her about it, she goes, I don't know. I just fucking did. Okay. Like, <laughs> you can tell she's fucking tired of hearing that question. So I thought that, you know, that's a pretty good reason if you ever need one. I don't fucking know, man. Leave me the hell alone. Yeah. I made it out alive, didn't I? Mama was too big. How <laughs> she survived, pal. Hey, she lived, bitch. <laughs> All right, man. Let's go to uh, social media questions to the app formerly known as Twitter. That guy, knife, football, and hockey emoji said, "Although Friday the Thirteenth is my favorite all-time franchise, I will stop and smell the deserved flowers on the true OG of the slasher franchises." Carpenter did a phenomenal job letting the viewer's mind create a fear beyond anything he could put on the screen. Love the podcast, brothers. We appreciate that. Randy Thanks, Smith, man. go dogs. 100 out of 10. Can't wait to go. hear y'all's uh, take on the best horror movie of all time. The soundtrack is amazing. Perfect mask. I could literally watch this movie at any time over and over again. And with a gator emoji. I guess he's because George is playing Florida this weekend. He put a screw in a gator. Oh, I couldn't tell what that was. It looks like, a, looks like a shot emoji. Oh, I see a screw now. Okay, screw gator. Get it you don't together, have your old man. On. Fuck. Sorry. You don't, you don't have your readers <laughs> Sorry, on, but it's yeah. a screw. <laughs> <laughs> Can't tell what that is. Uh, all right, let's go. Uh, Andrew Ferguson. Totally one of the best horror movies ever made. Kickstarted slasher flicks like Nirvana kickstarted grunge. Going to see it in the theater Monday night. Oh shit! Okay. Hell yeah! If we weren't recording, I was gonna do that too. So I'm glad we're recording though. Yeah, yeah, it's playing here too on Monday. Oh, nice. Night. Okay. Uh, new blood donor Fraser Rice can't add much that hasn't been said before. Clever, brutal, and strange opening. Great cast with JLC and DS and Super Score Carpenter at his peak with the high tension. Ten out of ten. His question was: Is there anything you guys would do differently? By the way, I enjoy the show. Can't wait to hear your take on this classic. Play the score a little less often. Spent early on, I can definitely agree with that. Like yeah, early some on. Parts early on. That. Yeah. I don't have anything, man. <laughs> I, don't. I don't. I think I've I've said the things that I would do differently, like just maybe shooting the uh, – when he disappears into the clothesline, shoot that sequence differently, uh, make sure that the wrench is not as visible as it is. Um, some of the logic, like Loomis not being able to see the car – yeah, maybe have an excuse for that or a reason for that. Park the, you know, park it in some damn bushes and have Michael have covered it up with some leaves or so. I don't know, things like that. Like Marty McFly did. Yeah, I know. Just bug tuck him yeah, on like a billboard. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, Nico. That's for Back to the Future. I don't know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> He's seen that one. And he does. Oh, and he doesn't like that. it. The only person in America. Uh, a really I like, quick. I like the first one. Yeah, first yeah. one was great. Yeah. Second one's mid. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, I know this had nothing to do with the question, but it made me think of it. Shout out to Dean Cundy working on this fucking movie again. We talked about him during Jurassic Park and our original review of this movie, but shout out to Dean Cundy, man. He was fucking phenomenal for this film. Sorry, go Absolutely. ahead. Absolutely. And uh, Sean the Glee Man still holds up as the best in the franchise. No convoluted cult. Relax. The one and only sister. 
no Corey, just a nice, straightforward maniac. Okay. Agreed, Sean. Way to go, buddy. <laughs> All right, on to the gram. Jesse Craft. Yes! Explanation point. My favorite horror movie of all time. Can't wait to hear you guys review this one. Halloween 1978 was actually one of my first childhood memories. It's why I'm such a huge horror fan today. One of the reasons why we will never move out of the L.A. area because we can visit the Myers house slash neighborhood in South Pasadena whenever we want to. That's pretty cool. That I'm jealous cool. of that. I've been, but I didn't get a bunch of great pictures, so I probably should have. That is not. That is awesome. Dale underscore, underscore Milburn. Not sure there's a movie out there that nails an atmosphere as good as this. Totally agree with that, Dale. Dark blue vibes, especially. Absolutely. This movie is one of the goats of horror. Absolutely. Ma- Fantastic. Mark Absolutely. underscore Hef, another one. The absolute goat. Someone should run this movie and zombies on two-hour projectors at the same time and show how you can have the same concept, plot, and music, and yet utterly create a masterpiece and also a pile of steamy shit that only incest-loving, <laughs> spit-in-your-mouth hillbillies could like. Oh, Jesus Christ, Mark underscore Hef. What movie was that? Love the pad pod, fellas. Really looking forward to this Hold one. On, what was he ref- Yeah, he was talking about Zombies 2008. He was talking about the how we <laughs> remember. <Yeah. laughs> oh, Rob Zombie. Rob- All right, pal. All right, pal. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, as an East Tennessean, I took offense to the 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 Embry comment. I'm not a fucking hillbilly. And second of all, <laughs> you keep Rob Zombie's name out your mouth, pimp. <laughs> Uh, somebody, I'm just somebody kidding. named I love uh, a good, uh, I love a good jab. somebody named Nico Chen said, "I promise to turn on the mic with this this time." <laughs> we'll see, Nico. We'll That's see. That's true. He did turn it on. <laughs> he did turn it on. He was caressing it earlier, and it looked pretty aroused. So whoa, whoa, whoa! Pause. Pause, 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 pause. That was crazy. That was crazy. <laughs> and the real Matt Sears, the goat. Really looking forward to this one. And last but not least, on the book of face, Christina Tower. Hey guys, so excited for this redo. This is one of my favorite horror movies, and Nico fucked the first one up. No, she didn't say that part. Or, <laughs> I love everything from the iconic score, which is totally my ringtone right now, to the story of how it was made. Also, such a great introduction to one of the best final girls. Hope you guys have a safe and spooky Halloween. You as well, Christina Tower. You as well. Appreciate that. All right, I only got a couple fun facts. Uh, the story is based on an experience John Carpenter had in college touring a psychiatric hospital. Carpenter met a child who stared at him with a look of evil, and it terrified me is what he said. And the last one that I got is Robert England of the A Nightmare on Elm Street film series revealed in an interview that John Carpenter had him throw bags of dead leaves on set for one day. That is episode 33. I don't know if you know this or not, but we interviewed the man, Robert England. You can watch that interview on YouTube and listen to it on podcast platforms. And where <laughs> else? Don't go out there, dot com. <laughs> All right, I got a, I got a few little fun facts, and by a few, I mean I got a goddamn laundry list. So bear with me. Uh, the stabbing sound effect is a knife stabbing a watermelon. Uh, half of the budget, which I'm not going to say the number, because Mike's got that, but half of the budget That's right. was spent I on remember. Panavision cameras, so the film would have a 2.35 to one scope. I don't know if I said that right. I've never actually said aspects like that. Uh, Donald Pleasance was paid twenty thousand dollars for a five day, five days of work. And Jamie Lee Curtis was paid a reported eight thousand dollars for her efforts. PJ Souls went on or went to a screaming of the movie after it was released, sitting in the fourth row of a regular audience. She was very amused when, during her nude scene in line of "See Anything You Like," a male audience member in front shouted, "Hell yes, I do!" <laughs> unaware that she was right behind him. <laughs> Dennis Quaid, who was uh, Souls's boyfriend at the time, asked her if she wanted him to confront the man. But she declined. She was too amused by the experience. When it Lori Strode and PJ Souls did, hell yeah, brother. wasn't Eddie? Holy shit! <laughs> no, that's Ra- um, that's Randy Quaid. I know, I'm just fucking around. <laughs> I was like, no, Randy Quaid's Wait, insane. You somewhere, serious, buddy? <laughs> you uh, the audio of the bullies telling Tommy he's going to get you. The boogeyman is coming. Is sampled on the beginning of White Zombie's cover of I'm Your Boogeyman, sung by Rob Zombie, who, of course, would go on to direct Halloween 2009 and Halloween 2, or uh, Halloween 2007 and Halloween 2, 2009. Uh, Michael Myers is full, this, this one, Michael Myers' full name, Michael Audrey Myers, is Michael only Audrey. mentioned in the television, in the television version of the film. In fact, the name Michael Myers is never said in the theatrical cut. He's referred to simply as Michael. Now, listen. 
I'm not saying I condone his actions, but you give me a middle name like Audrey, that's a woman's name. I'm probably going to be a little messed up too. And shout out to all of our guy listeners named Audrey. Just yeah, man, I know listeners. you've been through it. DM me, I'll, I'll <laughs> give you a drink. Uh, uh, the last one I have ties in with my side project, the Lord of the Ring wrestling podcast that I do. So any pro wrestler fans, give me a listen over there. Shameless plug. But pro wrestler Eddie Gilbert, aka or late great hot stuff Eddie Gilbert, competed Booker for Man. a Japanese hardcore wrestling promotion, promotion, Wrestling International New Generation in 1993. So this was right before he went to ECW under a mask using the ring name. Michael Myers. I thought that was cool. This movie had a whopping budget of, I remembered, I promise, $300,000 and was shot over the course of 20 days and went on to gross $47 million, which in today's money is somewhere around $247 million on a budget of 300000 which D- 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 Dustin mentioned, the majority was spent on Donald Pleasance and a fucking camera. So, there you go. Yeah. Hell yeah. Let's jump to our favorite kill, least favorite kill in the rating. I'll just go first. I'm going to be quick because my voice is about shot. Favorite kill, Bob. I mean, hard to not pick that one. It's the most iconic of the movie. Least favorite, I'm going to go with Annie in the car. It's not terrible, but I don't know, her face is sliding down the window just kind of extra ruins it for me. I'm not going to speak long here. It's I can't say anything that hasn't been said about this movie before. It's fantastic. It's shot well. It looks great. The Halloween score is amazing. It's played a little too much. Some of the acting is just okay. Uh, has some qualms like we all mentioned. I gave the movie a 9 out of 10. Very respectable. Very respectable. Same score as I gave the first time. I stay true. Okay, I'll I'll go ahead and go real quick. Favorite kill, Bob or Judith? You know, because I don't know if we noticed that, but Sandy Sandy Johnson, friend of the show, interview. Right. Don't go out there, dot com. Bam, 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 bam. That, was, that was different. That was a different jingle, Mike. All right, doesn't matter. Oh, <laughs> do, 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 do. <laughs> least favorite kill, Linda. Uh, I, okay, so forgive me. I had this little bit of a sidebar since I haven't really talked much tonight or the whole fucking time. But what's crazy to me is to think that this movie is 45 freaking years old. And I don't know if it's because I'm old because, you know, Mike loves to call me old or what, but it really hit me last week while we were doing scream because when I was younger, I would think of like nightmare and scream in like two separate eras that felt like eons apart, not 12 years. And so when we were talking about it last week and we were going, man, they're only 12 years apart in the early nineties when I was watching horror 45 years before that, we're talking about black and white monster movies. I mean, from the er- early 40s. Like, I just can't comprehend this lately. And it's Nico's favorites. fucking blowing my mind. Yeah, Nico's favorites. I told y'all in the first, in the first one, uh, my mom and I share a, a bond over this movie. She saw the OG in the theaters. My grandpa used to scare her and my aunt because they had the same patio doors. Um, I think there are a lot of stories like that, you know, between families and, and, and bonding over this movie, really. I gave this a 9.5 when you first recorded it. And like Nico, I'm going to stick with it. I'm, I'm going to stick with a 9.5. Let me go ahead and get mine. Um, favorite kill, Bob. I think that's probably going to be unanimous. Least favorite kill is the mechanic. It was off screen, unnecessary. Now, if we're counting overall least favorite, I'm going to go with the dogs. Those damn dogs didn't do nothing to you. Uh as far as my general thoughts and rating, I mean, I wasn't on the original episode, but this is definitely a movie that I had seen beforehand. Some of these movies, you know, we all watch for the first time when someone picks them, but this movie is just a classic. How can you not have seen this movie and appreciate it when you like horror? So um, it birthed the franchise. Sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing. This has gave us some good ones, so it's a good thing. Uh, it's just... If you don't watch any other movie, you, you feel satisfied with the ending. Uh, I, I had my nitpicks through it, but really those are nitpicks. I mean, even my biggest issues I had with the movie are nitpicks because you can watch it and appreciate everything, especially when you consider such a low budget. You know, it's an independent film. It's John Carpenter's was his third movie and the other two were small movies. And so it really put him on the map. This is just the acting is something that I forgive. I don't even think the acting, while it wasn't great in, in stretches and some of the uh, support cast wasn't great, 
I don't even hold that over their heads because it was such a low, low budget. Like you're getting inexperienced people. I can appreciate that. The score is iconic, even though you can do without it in certain points in the movie early on, it's still such a classic and iconic. Like when you think of not the movie Halloween, not the franchise Halloween, but when you think of late October, you think of like this song just plays in your head automatically, at least my head, when the leaves in my front yard start to change colors, that theme just like plays in my head when I look out the window. So it, it's hard to downplay how incredible of a feat that is to accomplish. So shout out to everyone involved. Um, it's not perfect, so I couldn't give it a 10, but I'm going to give it a 9, which if you pay attention to how I rate movies, that's basically a 10. Yeah. So. I was going to say that that's pretty high score from you, pal. For sure. Uh, yeah, yeah, like I said, I've made no bones about this being my favorite horror movie of all time, so I'm going to grade it on scale. All the nitpicks we had and some of the ones you guys had I agreed with, but I really just throw all those away, man. It doesn't do anything negatively to me when I watch this movie. Uh, I saved this movie. Now, I won't watch it this year on Halloween because we just watched it to do this review but i normally watch it on october 31st every year and i may pop it on again who knows but uh i save it i don't watch it throughout the year i save it for that one night a year and i always enjoy it it never gets old to me uh and it, it just has so many things i like and some you know a few things i didn't even talk about during our review how perfect is this fucking mask like yeah if you like some of the newer masks better that's fine but how awesome is this mask in this movie it and and it's not even so much the mask. It's the way the mask is lit throughout the film, especially in the dark scenes. Like, it's so perfect. Um, and shout out to Nick Castle. Again, he's not the best Myers, but he's the original Myers, and he's damn close to being the best Myers. So just really great stuff there. I love this character of the shape. My, not, not the Michael Myers we come to know later, but the shape, the original intent of that character. Ominous, you know, he was sitting in a room, staring at a wall, not seeing the wall, looking past the wall, looking to this night, inhumanly patient, as Dr. Loomis would say. Uh, just love everything about that character that we get. I love Dr. Loomis and his, like, basically cat and mouth chase, you know, this Tom and Jerry-like thing that we have going on here. And, the, you know, the original title for this movie was The Babysitter Murders, and I like that story. It did birth a trope, but I, I like that story. Why are you killing these people? Because they're... For no reason. They're babysitters. They're home. There's nobody there to protect them. They look like easy prey to me. That's what an animal does. And again, that's just, I like that motiveless killer. Love the lighting, the score, the acting, all of it, the directing, all of it's great. I gave this movie a 10. I changed. I tried to be almost too nitpicky during our original review, but I got to go with what I love, man. And that is this movie. So this is a perfect 10 in my eyes. All right, so that gives us a uh, composite score of 9.375. IMDb has it as 7.7. 7. Well, I don't so even, fucking know anything. I, even me, I'm going to say that's crazy. That's low for yeah, a Halloween <laughs> movie, uh, the Halloween movie. I want to say one more thing before I turn it back over to you. Um, you mentioned the mask, and I meant to say this. So the mask is iconic, looks great here. I read that William Shatner didn't even realize that he was the, uh, you know, it was his face or his likeness that was used until years later. Then he sued and they settled out of court, but they didn't even have to do that because it, it was a Captain Kirk mask. It wasn't a William Shatner mask and, and William Shatner doesn't own the rights to Captain Kirk. So they could have got off without paying a dime on that. That's well, I mean, Star Trek may have come after him. I don't know, but they didn't. So I don't know. Hey, to quote Patrice O'Neill, fuck you, William Shatner. I agree. <laughs> Fuck him. I went to I went to the Fanboy Expo a few years back, and uh, William Shatner had the most expensive autograph at the place. This was probably about a decade ago, and his his autograph I think was like two hundred dollars. And Vern Troyer's table was right beside him, and his his picture was like fifty bucks for a picture and an autograph. And William Shatner's two hundred dollars just for the autograph. And uh, Minnie Me's line was like extended through the the line stanchions and uh old dick face didn't have a single person in his line so yeah, fuck yeah. You, Shatner. let's shout out our blood donors christina towers she's a final girl donor really appreciate her we'll be doing her her film review in two weeks next week we got one more show before we close out october we got a new dream warrior level donor frazier rice 
Camper Level Reoccurring, Clayton J, Nina, Michelle Mirza, the Horror Movie Crew Podcast, Alex Seligson, Eric Doolittle, Sean Irwin, Kelsey Miller, and my boy CJ, Christopher James. Camp Counselor Reoccurring, Edwin Hernandez Gunn, Joe Swinford, Kylie Denise, all the way from Australia, Adrian Aiello, Karen, Brian Samick, and Andrew Ferguson. Just want to say thank you all. We Thanks, really guys. appreciate your support. It takes a big burden off of us. And, you know, the past few years since we've been doing this podcast, we've always done a big 31 ranking. Next Monday, the 30th, we're going to be going live. We haven't picked a dime yet, probably like 8 o'clock, something like that. We'll post on our social medias mm-hmm. for sure once we pick a time. We're going to be ranking all 31 of those movies. Uh, really excited. Uh, I'm glad to get the Children of the Corn franchise done and out of my life forever. But I'm excited <laughs> to do that you. ranking show. Uh, y'all got any final thoughts? Dustin, you got any thoughts? You asshole? How about an apology? Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to quote Conor McGregor, I like yeah. to take this time to apologize <laughs> to absolutely no one. The double champ does what the fuck he wants. Yeah, and then you pick next month's theme too, and you. Well, that's gonna oh, be fun. Man. That's gonna be fun. <laughs> I'm not getting paused. I'm just let's just end this episode. Halloween '78 definitely needed a redo. Absolutely. I turned my mic on. I redeemed myself. We redeemed the episode. It was great. Hope y'all enjoy it. Happy Halloween. Get your ass out of there. Just want to remind everybody. Oh.